My God is so big, so strong, so so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing my God can do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so. For you, and you, for you, and you, and you. Let's have David come up, do the benediction, let's go eat. <laughs> Boy, there's rooms full of people around the country and around the world that are watching, and somewhere in Arizona, there's just a room full of little kids sitting on the floor watching, you need to know that there's nothing that God cannot do for you. There's just nothing that God can't do for us. Dainu, right? It would have been enough. It would have been enough. Um, Yeah, my name's Charlie Rush. And um, what had happened was <laughs> somewhere between my junior year in high school and a park bench in Esther Short Park, I started consuming mass quantities of alcohol. And uh, I, that's who I am without Yeshua. Some friends um, said I could stay in their basement, and I mean basement, um, if I would, for cheap rent, if I would come to church like once a week. And so I came to church, and um, I didn't have any use for, for Christians at all, or church, or organized religion at all. Um, somehow or another, my mother raised me very well. My, my mistakes are all my own. Very fortunate to have wonderful parents. And um, so, yeah, so I um, I knew, I knew that the Bible was real and I didn't have any problem with the Bible. And I, um, I didn't have any problem with Jesus. I really didn't. I really didn't. I believed that Jesus was real. I believed he thought he was good. I believe he thought that he was sent from God. I really thought that, you know what I mean, in my thinking. I, I didn't. Um, anyways, they were serving communion, and I was up in the balcony and um, making fun of the lady that was singing and making fun of the guy that was preaching, which I really regret now. And the communion plate was going by, and I said, I'm not taking communion because I felt that that was disrespectful to Yeshua. I didn't know his name yet, but, you know, I was not into Messianic Judaism yet, but I, the communion plate came by, and I just said, no, thank you, because um, my being at church now, keep in mind, I was consuming a lot of alcohol, but my, my being at church in my mind did not have anything to do with my relationship to God, who I believe to be real. You know what I mean? And so I, um, when the communion came by, I didn't take it because I was like, I don't want to, again, I felt like Jesus thought he was real. You know, Jesus thought he was, and he did that. I think he probably did that for me. So I don't, I'm not going to take the communion because that's, that's just disrespectful to him and I'm not having that. And so the plate went by and the next thing to come by was the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit spoke. I said, so you're not taking the plate because you think there might be something to that. You're not taking that cracker and you're not taking that juice because you think there might really be something there. And so you're going to be just like, no, thank you. Okay. Okay. And in that moment, I realized this is not okay. This is not okay. 
And so I came down out of the balcony, and I talked to one of the pastors, and I was like, can you serve me communion? And he was like, you want communion? I was like, yeah, I want to take, I want, I'm a, I, I missed it. It's like, didn't, you were upstairs, you didn't get, no, I didn't, get, but I want to take communion. He's like, we, all, we already put it away. And they did, they put the lid on and everything. And he's like, all right, come with me. And we walked down that aisle and um, Dahinu, it would have been enough if the Holy Spirit had walked me through that if that man um, had discussed with me my need for Yeshua, my sins, the state of the world, eternity, it would have been enough for me just to not go to hell. It would have been enough for me to get out of that basement. I could have said, die no. God sobered me up, sent me to Bible college, total fiasco. God is good. <laughs> Dainu. Then there's this girl at Bible college. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I said Dainu. <laughs> I really did. Then come these wonderful children. Dayunu, Dayunu, Dayunu. <laughs> Seriously, I was Dayunu at two, actually. I could have been. <laughs> you guys, God is so good to us. Yeah. He is so good to us. What God has for us is so amazing. We can't even fathom it. But just look at what He's done. Look at what He's done. Turn to Exodus twelve fifty one. You... There's like four pair of reading glasses up here. I mean, seriously. Vision. All right. On that very day, Adonai brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their divisions. You guys were talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're talking about Passover, right? You guys, think about what had happened by the time they got to Exodus 12, 51. On that very day, Adonai brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their divisions. They just walked out of there. They just walked right out. And that it, they didn't have to fight their way out. There wasn't some sort of running battle. They just walked out. Not only that, but they were like, does anyone have any gold or silver we can have? Yes, here, please. Go take it. Take the gold and silver and go. Then they were like, there was Egyptians. They were like, can we come with you? Can we come with you? There was already these like wannabe people. Like, is there any like messianic Judaism that I could join up with? I could really... You guys, think of what it is. 430 years they were there. To the day, they just walked right out. They just walked right. They didn't hide. They didn't skulk. It wasn't under. No, they just, we're walking out of here. By their divisions. Everybody in your divisions, let's go. We're walking out. Take gold and silver with you. Yeah, if your Egyptian masters want to come with you, go ahead and let them come. Because we're walking out. That's what God did. That's what God did. You guys, getting out of, of Egypt, that was the easy part. Getting the Egypt out of us, that's tough. That's tough. So we celebrate Passover for a night. We celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread for a week, right? For a week. We don't just take out the loaves of bread and toss them out. Right? We search the house. We go through the whole thing. We open up all the cupboards and we, 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 we search, right? We do the little matzah thing. We get the kids and the, and the kids get to find the piece of matzah and get a few bucks or whatever it is. It's a teaching thing that the Lord gave us. I want you to get that matzah 
and eat it. I want you to get the hamats out. I want you to get the, the leaven out of your life. That's what it's about. We got to get the leaven out of our lives, guys. And so we take this. Thing. It's curious to me, like, you do, there's certain food restrictions that you don't eat. It's not good for you, right? But hamats isn't like super duper bad. You only get to don't eat it for a week, right? But it's a picture of sin, right? It's a picture of sin. That hamats, it's a picture of sin. And so you do this little game with the kids where you look around, you try to find it, and you go and you go up to the windowsill, which, by the way, the clean team is pretty amazing here. If you go up to that windowsill right now, it's gorgeous. There is no dust up there. There's certainly no matzah. I mean, no hamats, right? There's no crumbs up there. You guys, we do this little thing where we try to find all the... Do you know they're not even supposed to look at it? They're not even supposed to look at the leaven. Don't even have it around you. Don't even have it around you. Don't look at it. Guys, don't, don't just throw it in the back of the cupboard. Well, we just won't have... We, but it's there, though. Right? I'm just not going to look at that website during this week, but then I'll go back to it. No. You're supposed to throw it all the way out. I won't, I won't talk to that friend for just this week, but then I'll go right back to it. You're supposed to throw it out. You're supposed to throw it out. When I was, um, before I found Messianic Judaism, you know, there would be times, there would be seasons, and the pastor meant well. I believe the pastors meant well, but they would have, well, we're going to have a revival. We're going to have a thing, because they didn't know about the feast. They didn't know that God had built in these times. Like, God, if we're going to serve the Lord, we, can we be honest? If we're going to serve the Lord, we've got to take a time. We've got to take a week and evaluate some stuff. We've got to shut it down and say, we just really have to have some time. Don't we? Don't we? Don't you take your car in? Yeah, you take your car in and you have it maintained. It has to go to the mechanic. Even if you're a super good driver, you have to have time. If you, if you run a forklift or you, you run a truck, there's times where it just has to shut down for maintenance, right? Any, any fleet of boats, there's certain boats that are out there and there's certain boats that are on rotation. They're having a Sabbath. They're having a rest. They're having a time of evaluation. The Lord gave us this week to search our hearts, to take a hard look. 1 John 2.15 and 16 says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If someone loves the world, then love for the Father is not in him, because all the things of the world, the desires of the old nature, the desires of the eyes, and the pretensions of life are not from the Father, but from the world. Look, I don't do Facebook. Uh, I just don't. I don't really don't have the time for it anyways in the first place, but um, also... Um, that's a lot of reasons I don't do Facebook. Uh, you guys, so much of Facebook, it's pretentious. They're pretending. I, look, I know people who are, have, they have hired lawyers for their divorce. But not on Facebook. On Facebook, they're at the zoo with their kids. Wow, it got really quiet. How are you guys doing on Facebook? <laughs> That's pretensions. That's pretensions. Do not love the world or the things of the world. This world has nothing for you. This, hey, this world has nothing for you. It has only the desires. Did, what, did, stick to the notes, kid. <laughs> These things are not from the Father, but for, they're from the world. These evil things, that's not from your father, it's from the world. You guys, this world has nothing for us. This world is not our friend. Don't forget that, yeah, they let the Israelites go, and then what did they do? They all hopped in their best chariots and they chased them down. The world's not letting you go willingly, young man. The world wants you. The world doesn't love you. The world hates you. Wants you for a slave. Pharaoh wants you to build bricks for him. Pharaoh wants you to continue just build bricks for him in slavery. Slavery. This world has nothing for you except slavery and building bricks for the enemy. 
Romans 12, 2 says, in other words, do not let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the Olam Hazah of this world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be, keep letting, keep on letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The ongoing renewing of your minds. Why? So that you will be able, so that you will know what God wants and will agree that what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. God's got good stuff for you. All the things that God has done for you already. You are sitting here wearing clothes. Most of you have had a shower. You're doing well. All of these things that God has done for you, right? Dainu. There's so much more. Even just in this life, let alone e eternal pleasures at his right hand. Getting to just be with the Lord. Now, how many times do you drive through Macon and just look? That's not right. That's not right. That shouldn't be happening on that street corner. That shouldn't be happening. That's just not right. That's just not right. No one is going to walk down those streets of gold and go, oh, man, that's not right. No, you're just going to walk around like, that's right. That's right. That's good. That's, this is a great. Yes, this is good, right? This is good. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 through 8, get rid of the old hummets so that you can be a new batch of dough. Because in reality, you are unleavened. For our Pesach lamb, the Messiah has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder, not with leftover hummets, the hamats of wickedness and evil, but with the, the matzah of purity and truth. God wants us to walk in purity and truth. Young ladies, it's beautiful to God when you walk in purity and truth. Young men, when you conduct yourselves properly, it's beautiful to the Lord. The matzah of purity and truth. Guys, don't get, don't get stuck eating that, that matzah. I'm like, oh, i got to have stupid matzah. Ooh. Right? And you try to dress it up with your matzah burger. And you try to, yeah. Although I did have matzah pizza last night, and it changed my life. It was amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm seriously, I was like, thank you, God. I love <laughs> you guys, eat the matzah happy. Be happy for your matzah. Be thankful for your matzah. Be thankful. Turn, turn to, we're, we're going to do it early. I'm going rogue. Go to Psalm 16. I can't go rogue without my glasses. <laughs> Psalm 16. Is it up there? Yeah, pleasant places were measured out for me. I'm content with my heritage. Pleasant places were measured out for me. I'm content with my heritage. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Be content with what you have. You'd be a rich man with what God's given you. I'm content with what I have. I'm content with what I have. The shoes I'm wearing are from Kim Yon. The socks I'm wearing are from Carrie McLaurin. I'll stop there. I'm just saying, I am not this rich person that God has. Uh, I drove here in someone else's car. It was a gift to me. I'm not this rich person. But boy, am I rich. Because I'm very content with what I love my ketchup socks that Carrie gave me. You guys, I'm content with what I have. I love my matzah. I love my matzah. I don't want that hamatz. I don't want that leaven. I don't want that leaven. I'm not count there to live. when I was when I first when I was first celebrating unleavened bread. I was like I would be on Thursday. I'm like for the love of God, just one little Hawaiian roll, you know, like you know, come on. But you guys, part of this is sanctification, right? Salvation, salvation is getting out of Egypt, right? That's salvation. Wandering through the wilderness, there's a sanctification process, right? But y'all, I know, because I know what you're thinking. You're like, Dainu, Dainu. 
But there's still the promised land, baby. There's still the promised land. But on the way there, I'm to enjoy my matzah. I'm to enjoy the boundary lines for me. We're, 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 the places measured out for me, I'm content with my heritage, right? I'm content with that. Pleasant places have been measured out for me. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for me. I like my boundary lines, yeah. right? See, the enemy wants to come in and make, oh, don't you hate that matzah? Ooh, can't you wait for your Hawaiian roll? Oh, and the enemy wants to make it. And, 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 and he, this is what he always does. He comes in the garden. They were in the garden of Eden. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to do a lot of things. But then here comes Satan. Right? You tell him, well, I don't know. Did he really say? Is that really the boundary line? Don't you want to? No, I really don't. I really don't. And I refuse to allow Satan to speak into my ear and make me think that the boundary lines that have been measured out for me have fallen in somehow unpleasant ways for me. I tell my boys all the time, when I drive to work, I drive 69 miles an hour. When I drive home, I drive 70-something miles an hour because I want to get home. I like them boundary lines. Yes. I go home. It's somebody else's house. I go home. My wife is there, my kids, my dog freaks out and has a total fit. <laughs> the boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for me, y'all. You guys don't allow the enemy to try to tell you that you, you oh, well, I really, I really need to get some, I really need to get some hummets on this. I really sprinkle a little bit of, no, you guys get rid of that stuff. Pleasant places were measured out for me. You guys, don't forget, Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? I'm going to eat my matzah with joy and gratitude. The same God is saving you. That same God that walked him out, just walked him out of Egypt, and walked him through the wilderness, and walked him straight into the promised land. That's your God that you serve. That's your master. That's my master. That's who's, that's who's saving us actively right now. Amen. That's who's saving us from all the things that we're going through. And I know that we're going through things. You guys, this, for 2 Corinthians 4.16, this is, this is why we don't lose courage. That's why we don't lose courage. Though our outer self yeah. is, is heading for decay, our inner self is being renewed daily. Amen. Now see, you, this, this whole crew over here, over here by the windows, the young folks... They don't know that verse yet. They don't care. They don't care. I blew straight past that verse many times. Like, okay, well, whatever. I guess there's some sort of decay or something. Right? You, get, you hit 40 and you're like, Lord, I claim it. I love it. It's my verse. Yeah, you're going you, <laughs> to... It's coming for you. But don't lose courage. Don't lose courage. I know there's arthritis. I know we don't hear as well. We don't see as well, right? There's all kinds of itises. Yeah. I used, in Georgia, people just have the itis. I didn't know that that was a thing, but like, I got the itis. But we don't lose courage because though our outer self is wasting what our inner man, our, right? It's, be, it's being renewed daily, daily. James 4, 8 says, come close to God and he will come close to you. Clean your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Don't forget, as much as you want to be saved, God is so much more willing that you be saved. God wants you saved. He wants you happy. He, I don't, I don't, now look, that is a mystery to me. I haven't figured that out yet. Why, why does God care about Charlie Rush? I re- Somebody just said amen. That wasn't the right time for an amen. I, I, that hurt. I'm not going to lie. They were like, I know. I know. You guys, I don't know why God cares about us so much. I know we're created in his image, but we mess up so badly, so badly, so badly. Come close to God and he will come close to you. Clean your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
God wants you to be healthy. He wants you to be saved. He wants to take care of you. You guys, after, after Pharaoh had let the people go, don't forget this. This is important. After Pharaoh had let the people go, God didn't guide them to the highway that goes through the land of the Philistines because it was close by. God thought that the, the people, upon seeing war, might change their minds and return to Egypt. I love that it says, God thought that. Well, I wonder what gave him that idea. <laughs> like, like, I love this. Well, well, God thought. Yes, God thought that. You guys, salvation is leaving the slavery of sin. Sanctification. It's not always a direct route. It's not always a direct route. This doesn't make sense to the world. It didn't make sense to Pharaoh. It didn't make sense to Pharaoh when it was like, what they, we just let them out. What are they doing out there? They're just wandering around. Let's take another whack at it. Sometimes for Christians, our route, it doesn't make sense to the world. It doesn't make sense to the world. Right? If I had turned in the last 47 years to some career coach, she'd have been like, well, that's very strange. Right? Right? Literally, when they took my college transcripts, the guy was like, it was a mess. It looked like someone had taken like, some crayons to it or whatever. You guys, it doesn't make sense to the world. It's not always this straight line. In the natural, listen to me, listen to me. In the natural what the Lord does doesn't always make sense to us. You and I, we, we are still in a natural state. We're in our natural bodies. We live in the natural world, right? But God, God is supernatural. He's supernatural. So I'm down here walking around being natural, right? And what God does in my life is he comes along and he slaps some super on my natural. Wham! <laughs> and he gets hold of my life. Supernaturally. Yes. He gets hold of my life. He changes me supernaturally. This in the natural, I should be dead by now. I was on a park bench. And I'm just telling you, I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know there was better for me. I just thought, well, I guess I'm going to live on a park bench. Right? I upgraded to a basement. That was good enough for me, and I had stayed there for a long time. Worked at Doolin's Diner and just had a great old time drinking my money. I didn't know. I didn't know this. You guys, Yeshua's disciples, they had the same thing. If you look at John 6, this is Yeshua's second Passover that, that he celebrates with them. The book of John records all three of those Passovers. They're asking him, hey, give us bread. Give us bread. Because he's getting bread, right? Like, give us this bread. You, you got bread. Give us bread. Show, what, what sign will you give us, right? That we'll believe you. What sign will you give? Again, they were looking at the natural things, right? They wanted to take him and seize Yeshua by force. And they wanted to drag him in and force him to be their king, to be, the, to be the king of the Jews, and to get rid of the Romans, and to set up shop. Those are natural things, right? Those are natural things to desire, right? Let's get the Romans out of here and get this party started, right? In the natural, that makes sense. But God had supernatural plans for them. So they said, show us the sign, show us some bread. And Yeshua answered, I am the bread. I am the bread, which is life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever trusts in me will never be thirsty. That sounds great, right? It was like, okay, great. Then Yeshua said to them, Yes, indeed, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. That is, I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food and my, my blood is true drink. See, that doesn't work for them because 
human sacrifice is forbidden and cannibalism is also a bad idea. So they don't know what, they don't know that he's speaking about supernatural things. They're, t- they're talking about natural things, right? So instead of all the people said, amen, all the people said, uh, what? Uh, yeah. They didn't understand what Yeshua was doing. They didn't understand what was going on. He, he, he goes for he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I live in him just as the living father sent me and I live through the father. So also whoever eats me will live through me. So this is the bread that comes that has come down from heaven. It is not like the bread the fathers ate. They're dead. But whoever eats this bread will live forever. You guys, that makes total sense to us now. Because why? Because that was the second Passover. The third Passover of, of Yeshua's public ministry hadn't happened yet when he did become their Passover lamb. When he did die for their sins. And they saw that and they witnessed that. So it makes sense to you and I because we know that we have a Savior and we know that he was our sacrifice, but they didn't know that yet. And so a lot of them, they stopped following him. Yeah. On hearing that many of his Talmudim said, this is a hard word. Who can bear to listen to it? Who can bear to listen to this? This is crazy. They didn't understand what you and I are able to know. Now listen. Yeshua, aware that his Talmudim were grumbling about this, said to them, <laughs> This is a trap for you? Like you're tripping over this? Yeah. Like you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Suppose you were to see the Son of Man going up back up to where he was before, which I'm sure they were like, what? Oh, where are you going up to? What is it? What? They have no idea that they were going to see Jesus ascend, just go right up into the clouds. Here goes Messiah. They didn't know. And he's telling him, he's like, he's calling his shots. He's like, you'll see, you'll see. But from this, from this time on, many of his Talmudim turned back and no longer traveled with him. Of course, it has to be John 6, 66 too. That's a lot of sixes. <laughs> Sorry, I just... So Yeshua said to the twelve, don't you want to leave too? Don't you want to leave too? Yeshua wants worshipers that will worship him in spirit and truth. He wants people that will go all the way with him. No turning back. No turning back. And Peter answered him, To whom will we go? You have the word of eternal life. Did he say, Lord... To whom will we go? We understand everything you're saying. Who, where else will we go? We understand everything you're about, Lord. We understand you completely. It all makes perfect sense. I love that we don't have any followers left. I love that everybody's trying to kill you, Lord. This is great. He said, where else are we going to go? You have the word of eternal life. Don't you forget God has the word of eternal life. Do I understand everything the Lord does every time? Nope. I don't understand this that's happening right this second. I don't understand. But he has the words. He has the word of eternal life. You don't often see people answer Yeshua's question with a question. But I think Peter's heart was so pure before he was like, where are you, where are we going to go? I mean, yes, hypothetically, if we were going to leave you, where would we go? There's no place else to go except to follow him all the way. You followed him out of Egypt. You followed him through the wilderness. You can follow him to the promised land. You followed him in life. You can follow him in death. You will follow him in resurrection. There's no place else to go. Amen. John 13, 1. It was just before the festival of Pesach. And Yeshua knew that the time had come for him to pass from this world to the Father. Had 
Having loved his own people in the world, he loved them to the end. He loves you to the end. Yes. He loves you to the end. Luke 27, I'm sorry, Luke 22, 7 is a verse that I blew past all the time before um, um, before I met Rabbi. Before I understood the scriptures so much better. It just kind of opens up that paragraph and he says, Then came the day of matzah, on which the Passover lamb had to be killed. And don't you know that when Luke wrote that, it was several years after Jesus, Yeshua had done what he had done, then came the day of matzah on which the Passover lamb had to be killed. And uh, for 15, 16, 17 years of my Christian life, I read that and thought that Luke was talking about like a Passover lamb, like a baby lamb that had to be killed. Then came the day of matzah on which Yeshua, our Passover lamb, couple more of these because I want you to see all the way back in John 1 29 <clears throat> John the Baptist or Yochanan the Immerser he's baptizing people in the Jordan John saw Yeshua coming towards him and he says look God's lamb the one who's going to take away the sin of the world the sin of the world. Yes. Not the sin of the Jewish people. The sin of the whole wide world. The sin of the whole wide world. You guys. John knew that he was Yeshua's forerunner. He was born first. He started his ministry first. He was killed first. And he sees him coming and he tells all these people, they're not, the, there's people at that time out there in the wilderness at the Jordan, they went there to see Yeshua. Yeshua came there to see John. These were John's people. These were John's people there to see John. And so they're all focused. John's standing down there in the water or whatever, and they're all focused on John. Everybody's backs to Yeshua as Yeshua walks up and John's baptizing. He looks up and he sees Yeshua come. He says, look, God's lamb. Come to take away the sin of the world. Come to take away the sin of the world. Once and for all. One sacrifice for everybody. Not this continual sacrifice that needs to keep happening. Pure, 100% sinless person. He was fully human, but he was also fully God. You guys, don't forget... Listen, 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 listen. God loves you. You are created in his image. And his desire is to protect you. Go ahead and look at Psalm 17, 8. It's a Psalm of David. Oh, thank you, Tony. God wants to protect you. He wants to love you. He wants you to be safe. And I remember when my children were first born, man, like I would, I remember when Nathan was first, my oldest son was born, I would go and like lock the door and I would just like, you know, there's a baby in the house. You know, you drive more safe with the baby in the car. Like I would walk around, check to make sure nothing was on and everything was like, I was baby proofing the house. Like he's in his crib. He can't even like eat a bottle yet, but I'm like, it's safe. Everything's safe, right? I'm just stare and look at the front door, see if the lock was turning. I kind of wanted to pound somebody. Like I want, you know, like to protect. You guys, Psalm 17, 8 says, David, 
he asks God and he says, protect me like the pupil of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. And being hid in the shadow of God's wings, that's something we can understand really well, right? We understand from Psalm 91 that, that God would, would, would gather his chicks under his wing, right? And, and we all know how that works, right? That, that uh, you know, the, the, in the barnyard or whatever, the, the mama chick will spread her wings, right? And it's the responsibility of the little baby chicks to run in there to be protected. I'm not going to chase you all over the barnyard. You've got to come to where I'm at, right? This is some nonsense. You get over here. You heard me clucking. You better get over here. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for you. Now get over here. God wants you to be protected. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be healthy. But this first part, though, protect me like the pupil of your eye. And you can do a word study on that. I was going to put it all up. But you know what? Theologians and, um, and, and, and scholars, I don't think they focus on the right thing when they think of it. They were like, oh, it's the apple of your eye. It's the little man of your eye. And they try to figure out you know, exactly the etymology of of that word, but I don't think the pe- I mean, it's a beautiful idea, right? Protect me like the apple of your eye, of your eye. That is, that is a beautiful concept, but the operative word is protect. Yes. Protect me like the pupil of your eye. Did you know? I'll bet you didn't. I'm going to tell you. Did you know your whole body is involved in the protection of your eye? Your eyeball is um, irreducibly complex for one thing. Darwin's whole concept of, um, of evolution doesn't work because of irreducible complexity. And that's not me saying that. That's not Charles Rush. That's Charles Darwin said. Yeah, I don't understand irreducible complexity. Your eyeball is so complex that it cannot have evolved to that state. If you remove your eyebrows, and I said eyebrows. Some of you guys go ahead and work on that. But no, that's wrong. <laughs> if you remove your eyebrows... You, it, 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 it removes some of the protection of your eyeball. You need your eyelashes for your eyeball to be protected. You have eyelids to protect your eyeball, right? You have a cornea and you have tear ducts and you have all these things. But you also have all these instincts that protect your eyes. Your eyes are protected. We, your elbow isn't protected that way. If a puff of wind comes, what happens? You go like this. Your whole body, your nerves in your eyeball... They go straight back to your brain. There's something called a, I was going to wow you with a bunch of 12-syllable words, but the Lord said, you can't pronounce them, just forget it. <laughs> your whole body is involved in the protection of your eyeball. Your whole body. If you get a puff of wind on your elbow, you're like, somebody blew on my elbow. You know, your elbow don't care. It's a bunch of bone in there. Your eyeballs need protecting. Your eyeball needs protecting. It's fragile. It's delicate. And so the way God created your eyeball, all of these defense mechanisms are involved in it, right? Where it's not just your eyelid and your eyelashes and your cornea and all things. When you get a puff of wind, your whole body will recoil. Your hand goes up. Nobody teaches you to do that. That's instinctive. Look, you mess with my children. I'm going to beat you down. That's instinctive. Nobody has to really teach me that too much. I know how to protect my children. Don't speak loudly to my wife. It's just a thing I have. And if I, being evil, know how to protect my kids, if I, being evil, know how to protect my wife, How much more our Heavenly Father, who is not evil, but pure and perfect and beautiful and wise and powerful. Consider this the next time you speak loudly to his wife. Consider this the next time you mistreat his children. Consider this when you have something negative to say about. Consider your way. God calls us the apple of his eye. He's protecting you like the apple of his eye. He wants good things for you. Nobody nobody knows how to protect and preserve. Nobody knows how to do it like God. The boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places for you. Be content with your matzah. 
leave that leaven alone. Just leave it alone. It's not for you. It's not good for you. Know that. Know that God's protecting you like the apple of his eye. When he said, leave it alone, it's for your own good. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. David. Won't you stand with me? Thank you, Charlie, for putting it in words that we could understand. <laughs> Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. That uh, he could use a man to speak on an eternal level naturally to us so we could understand it with our finite brains. Thank you again, Charlie. Great message. Um, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Shalom. Shabbat shalom and hag sameach.